The eighth Democratic debate for the 2020 election will kick off in Manchester, New Hampshire on February 7th, four days prior to the New Hampshire primary contest. Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, Tom Steyer, and Andrew Yang have all made the debate stage. In this video, I'll talk about a number of issues surrounding the upcoming debate. Top of mind for everyone, of course, are the results from the Iowa caucus which have continued to gradually dribble out nearly a week after the contest was conducted. I'll talk more about this after the intro, but let me say now, the bungling of the caucus reporting by the Iowa Democratic Party has been an absolute embarrassment. The Democratic primary campaigns had focused a ton of money and effort in Iowa in order to have a chance of declaring victory on the night of the caucus. The slow, gradual release of results has potentially seriously diminished the meaning of winning in Iowa. After all, the real value of the caucus is potentially generating momentum with an early win, not the actual delegates one as they represent just 1% of the national total. After the IDP dropped the ball in 2020, candidates in future presidential primary contests may look to Iowa and think, what's the point? Many of you will be pleased to know that the New Hampshire debate marks the return of Andrew Yang. Aside from adding diversity to the otherwise all-white stage, Yang in my view tends to contribute significantly to the diversity of ideas being discussed at these events. While my general support for Bernie Sanders should probably bias me in favor of debates with as few participants as possible, I really missed having Yang on the debate stage at the Iowa debate, and I am glad to see him back. While Yang is at this point highly unlikely to secure the nomination of the party, the level of success he's had at spreading his message and changing the discourse should, I believe, be applauded, especially when you consider that he's an outsider with virtually no experience in politics, and the policies he's fought for are, by and large, quite fringe in the Washington bubble. The New Hampshire debate may also be the last without Michael Bloomberg. The billionaire former mayor of New York, who has seen significant growth in the polls due to massive spending put out by his self-funded campaign. Bloomberg's campaign has previously put out there that they have little interest in competing in the early states, but ahead of Super Tuesday, the business mogul is hoping to build up enough popularity to create a come-from-behind victory. The DNC seems all too happy to oblige. Because Bloomberg's campaign is self-funded, he was never expected to meet the grassroots support threshold previously set by the Organization for Democratic Debates. But now the DNC has reversed course and thrown out that requirement. This move was fairly controversial and criticized by representatives of the Yang campaign and the Sanders campaign. Indeed, it seems a bit hypocritical. As you may recall, the DNC was unwilling to change rules after Tulsi Gabbard's campaign pointed out that highly regarded polling organizations were being excluded from the DNC's list of approved media partners, which in turn resulted in her exclusion from the stage in a previous debate. In some sense, the DNC might feel indebted to Bloomberg. He has, after all, been a significant contributor to the Democratic campaigns for some time and was even the top Democratic donor in the 2016 presidential election. Adrienne Watson, a spokesman for the DNC, defended the move, though, saying, Now that grassroots support is actually captured in real voting, the criteria will no longer require a donor threshold. You might be surprised to hear me say this, but this is not necessarily total nonsense. While the grassroots fundraising requirement has been removed, a new indication of support, aside from polling, has been added. There will now be a delegate's threshold in order to be on stage for Nevada. Specifically, a candidate needs to win at least one delegate in the Iowa caucus or New Hampshire primary in order to qualify. Like the fundraising threshold, this is a substantial measure of success, one that will likely cut out the least viable candidates. As for the polling threshold, candidates will now be required to hit 10% in at least four qualifying polls, which may be national or focused on Nevada and or South Carolina or a candidate must hit 12% or more in at least two polls in early states Nevada or South Carolina. Candidates unlikely to meet the polling threshold include Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, and Amy Klobuchar. There's not even a guarantee that Pete Buttigieg will qualify in the polls, although of course meeting the delegate threshold will be enough to secure him a spot. Speaking of polling, one major factor sure to affect the dynamics at play for the New Hampshire debate is the polling coming out of the state. Sanders, who began surging in the polls beginning around January 20th, 
lead significantly in New Hampshire. According to RCP, the support breaks down like this. Sanders with 25.5%, Biden 17.7%, Buttigieg 15.7%, Warren 13.8%, Klobuchar 7.8%, Gabbard 4.2%, Steyer 3.2%, and Yang with 3.0%. While Sanders, a popular Vermont senator, might have been expected to lead in neighboring New Hampshire, this was not a sure thing. Biden was briefly the frontrunner of the state in mid-January, Buttigieg was leading in mid-December, and throughout most of November, Elizabeth Warren was the top dog there. Just ahead of the New Hampshire primary, at a debate in the state, there's no doubt that all candidates will have the contest top of mind. This clearly puts a target on Sanders' back, which might actually be good news for him. Sanders tends to have a poor debate performance when he is ignored, as he then usually reverts to stump speeches we've all generally heard by now. But when put on the defensive, he tends to be more captivating. Adding to the likeliness of a Sanders pile-on, of course, are the results coming out of the Iowa caucuses. Iowa, the first proving grounds of presidential hopefuls, has historically had incredible influence over the rest of the primary process, despite the fact that their delegates account for just 1% of those voting at the Democratic National Convention. While 96 to 97 percent of precincts are now reporting, the final numbers coming out of the Iowa caucus have yet to come in. Without having all precincts reporting, we cannot accurately project how many national delegates each candidate has won, which is really the most substantial information we can get out of the caucus. As it stands, Sanders and Buttigieg are likely to remain tied for first by this measure, Elizabeth Warren is coming in a distant third, in a shocking turn, Biden may walk out of Iowa having earned zero national delegates. From what data has been reported, it seems clear now that Sanders was the top choice when it came to the first alignment, standing with around 25% of the vote, followed closely by Mayor Pete at 21%. For the final count, Sanders stayed in the lead with 27% of the vote, with 25% going to Buttigieg. In terms of state delegate equivalents, Pete currently leads the field with 26.2%, just 0.1% ahead of Sanders at 26.1%. That's a difference of just three state delegates. And based on where this data is coming in from, the New York Times is currently projecting that Sanders is more likely than not to overtake the mayor. As far as we can make conclusions at this point, it appears that Bernie Sanders leads when it comes to popular support in Iowa leading with both initial preference and final alignment. When it comes to the delegate count, results are still coming in, but we're currently looking at what amounts to a tie between Sanders and Buttigieg. The fact that Sanders essentially tops the field is no surprise, but it puts a clear target on his back ahead of the New Hampshire debate. He's projected to win there also, and winning both of the first two states could easily generate enough momentum for his campaign to win the Democratic primary, particularly with Sanders leading in the largest state in the union, California, which will be voting on Super Tuesday. Pete Buttigieg, regardless of whether he matches, beats, or even falls slightly behind Sanders in the delegate counts, will also take the stage as a winner. Widely projected to fall in third place, Pete overcame expectations. While his electability in the 2020 election has been challenged in past debates, Iowa was the first real test, and Pete passed with flying colors. Time will tell whether he'll be able to parlay his success in Iowa into other states. Nationwide, he had been fading in the polls for some time. But aside from Sanders, Pete is the most effective fundraiser in the field, and Iowa demonstrates his campaign knows not just how to raise it, but also how to spend it. Don't underestimate the effect of the Iowa caucus on the New Hampshire debate. Both Sanders and Buttigieg now look like winners. The downside will be that they will have an increased chance of being attacked by the other candidates on stage, although that's only a downside if they're not able to counter effectively. Remember, getting mentioned also gets you more time. Both are also likely to deliver strong performances regardless. Nothing looks more presidential than winning. Both of their messages can now resonate more powerfully. Buttigieg can frame himself in a similar manner as Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or John Kennedy, a young, fresh face representing a new generation, defying the odds to usher in a new era of the Democratic Party. Sanders, too, has a narrative to sell, the serious progressive rising above the establishment's ire to deliver a win for the people. As for Elizabeth Warren, Iowa's results so far look better than expected, but that's not saying much. 
Third place may be enough to keep her in the race, but the Iowa results are no win for her campaign. Still, better to be in her shoes than those of Joe Biden. Biden, who was widely expected to take first or second place in Iowa, appears to have come in a distant fourth and may walk away having failed to earn even a single delegate. This greatly damages his position as the prospective frontrunner in this race. Andrew Yang and Tom Steyer also failed to deliver in Iowa. Anyone still thinking that either of them might have a real chance of securing the nomination might want to reconsider. Steyer's best shot is to do well in Nevada and maybe even win South Carolina. But even if he did that, I don't see how that's enough to pull his nationwide numbers into serious contention. As for Yang, it breaks my heart, but I don't see a plausible path forward. At any rate, neither is polling particularly well in New Hampshire, and both are likely to be non-entities in this debate. Don't get me wrong, they can still have valuable contributions to the conversation, one is far more likely to do so than the other, in my view, but they're not likely to be treated as serious competitors by the other candidates on stage. As for Klobuchar, her campaign tried to portray the early Iowa results as indicating it's a five-person race. If that's true, she's not one of those five people. Biden doing poorly in Iowa might very well open up a vacuum in the moderate lane, but it's far more likely to be filled by Buttigieg, who did well, or Bloomberg, who has enough money to potentially compete in later states and is seeing growth in the polls. Klobuchar's campaign is over, whether she knows it or not. Another problem for Klobuchar going into the New Hampshire debate is that her campaign is facing a bit of a crisis, with renewed attention to her record as a prosecutor. Sound familiar? A tough on crime prosecutorial record was enough to sink Kamala Harris's campaign, despite her early popularity in the primary race. Klobuchar has faced scrutiny for going after low-level non-violent crimes for at least a year now, but her record is now facing more criticism than ever before after reporting by the AP exposed her involvement in the conviction of a black teenager, apparently with very scant evidence. The accused Mayan Burrell was sentenced to life in prison. To this day, he maintains his innocence. Activists from the NAACP and Black Lives Matter have called on Klobuchar to end her campaign. So all in all, Sanders and Buttigieg are set up to face conflict on stage, but their success in Iowa also sets them up for a victory in this debate. Biden, Warren, and Klobuchar enter the debate looking a bit diminished. And as for Yang and Steyer, their campaigns face an even more lethal question. 